Nee, aber ich hätte, fast, ich hätte eigentlich gedacht, dass noch mehr Leute kommen. Ich weiß gar nicht, was ich sagen soll. Nee, du, ich muss mir erst mal überlegen, was ich... Ja. Hm? Na, hier im Iri eigentlich immer schon relativ pünktlich. Ja. Oi, bom dia a todos. Temos participantes alemãos. Então, vamos começar mais ou menos pontualmente. <lacht> Uh, bom dia a todos. Uh, eu uh, quero agradecer a todos por ter vindo e agradecer também o IRI para a cooperação, para o espaço aqui. E, e vou brevemente apresentar o nosso palestrante de hoje, um, Detlef Nolt, que era até, até pouco o diretor do Instituto Latino, de Estudos Latino-Americanos no GIGA, o German Institute of Global and Area Studies, em Hamburgo, em Alemanha. E agora eh, ele formalmente está aposentado, mas de fato quase mais ativo e mais viajando para congressos e para palestras do que antes, que ele falou. <laughs> Então, ele já, esse ano, eu acho que já estive em Colômbia, Equador e mais alguns países. E vai depois, ele também vai para Chile para ser professor visitante. E o ano próximo é planejado que ele vai retornar também como professor visitante para um tempo um pouco mais longo para a USP. Uh, mas também, também não é a primeira vez que ele vem, ele já esteve aqui várias vezes, principalmente no ano passado, organizamos juntos parceria entre o GIGA e a Cátedra Martius de, dos, de Estudos Alemães e Europeus, que eu uh, represento aqui, e, uh, organizamos juntos as Jornadas Europeias na Faculdade de Direito, e, uh, sobre o tema de regionalismo comparativo, comparative regionalism, regionalism under stress, com vários convidados internacionais. E ele também já esteve várias vezes aqui no IRI uh, para várias atividades, também uma vez com outros colegas do GIGA. Uh, também existe uma parceria formal entre o IRI e o GIGA. Não sei exatamente o que significa. Tem que perguntar à diretora e ela se <risos> tem interesse um, nisso. E, uh, então, acho que tem uma boa cooperação já entre o IRI e a USP em geral um, e o professor Nolt, o, o, o GIGA também teve já várias pessoas como pesquisadores visitantes uh, no, IRI, no, no, no GIGA do IRI aqui, por exemplo, o Kai Eno Lehmann, uh, que, que ficou no IRI. Um, então, o Dedle faz pesquisa sobre várias temáticas com relação à América Latina, Uh, tanto na área de política comparativa como, mais recentemente, mais na área das relações internacionais, das organizações regionais em particular, uh, e uh, o, o, a temática, por exemplo, de, da sobreposição das organizações regionais na região, da segurança regional e várias outras temáticas. E também na linha desse, dessa missão de trazer o tema de o, a comparação entre organizações regionais, comparações entre uh, as organizações europeias e as organizações latino-americanas. E também a questão que vai ser uh, o sujeito da palestra de hoje, como se, ou se se podem usar as experiências dos, das, dos estudos da integração europeia para explicar a integração, a cooperação regional em outras regiões, particularmente em América, na América Latina. Um, sim. É, outra coisa que queria dizer, não sei, não lembro. Então, acho que, acho que é isso. E estou muito feliz de, 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 de fazer as bem-vindas novamente para o Dedlev aqui. E acho que vai ser uma palestra muito interessante. 
E les vou deixar agora com o Detlef e vamos fazer a palestra em inglês, mas um, ela entende também português se, se falado lentamente, então se alguém quiser fazer uma pergunta em português depois, ou espanhol também, um, portunhol também, <risos> alemão, <risos> essas são as opções na mesa. Então, muito obrigada e desfrute. So, so, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And, uh, I think very, I'm very glad to be back here again. Uh, yesterday I had to speak in Spanish, and I tried to understand more Portuguese. Now I will speak in, in English, so I will see how, well, what mix of languages will come out at the end. Uh, this, this, this presentation that I will give now will be possibly, or a part of the presentation will be part of, of, a, of a book that I'm preparing with Britta, which will be the result of the conference that we had last year on regionalism and under stress, uh, Latin America and Europe in comparative perspective. Maybe that my presentation, it's too long when I see that you all become bored, I will can cut down some parts, so, so, we'll, so we'll see how we advance. Okay, perhaps as a starting point, I hope this functions. I, I think uh, I, f I found these this nice quotations at, uh, when I started to prepare my, my presentation. Because as you know now, regionalism is, is in crisis in Latin America, but also in, in, in Europe. And there is this famous uh, quotation by Jean Monnet. I think it's always good when, when you speak about regionalism to start with, uh, with, a, with a quote or a citation from Jean Monnet, where he say, I have always believed that Europe would be built through crisis and that it would be the sum of their solutions. So it's this certain optimism that the European Union has grown based in crisis. And there's also this, this second uh, uh, quotation by, by uh, Zoe Lefrochidi and Philip Schmitter, saying crises have been an integral part of the process of European integration and by, by and large they have had positive effects. Collective reactions to crises by national actors have led to an increase in the authority and or an and expansion of the task of the institution of the EU and its predecessors. So one might ask whether this optimistic, optimistic view of European crisis is still justified, and there are a lot of authors now who have a more critical view, as this book recently published by, by Dinan, Natch, and, and Patterson on the, the multidimensional crisis in Europe, or the European crisis, which say, for many Europeans, the EU is no longer seen as a solution to a problem, or a set of problems, but as a problem in itself. So the question that, that I ask myself uh, when I was reflecting about the crisis in Europe, whether the, this crisis, these are, which are multidimensional, we have the Euro crisis, the refugee crisis, and we have also the Brexit, uh, whether this has been good or bad for comparing the EU and Latin American regionalism, whether crisis in Europe is something which might it make it easier to compare Europe with Latin America. And there are different, uh, there are different reactions uh, uh, from uh, researchers doing research on, on, on regionalism. There's one nice quote that I, that I found from two colleagues working on, on, on Asian regionalism. But I think when you read the quote, you might uh, substitute ASEAN for Mercosur or for UNASUR. They say the Brexit crisis has to an extent reinforced the view that the EU is not a body to be replicated elsewhere and that ASEAN, you can say also Mercosur or whatever regional organization in Latin America, and the EU are distinct, but these ideas had been around for quite some time in Asia and Latin America. While some argue that the Brexit referendum result has threatened the EU's example of regional integration, the idea that the EU has ever an and art has ever been an archetype of integration has long been dismissed by scholars and practitioners and the general public. Brexit will likely consolidate existing perceptions in Asia, one could say also Latin America, about the EU, that European-style integration has little relevance for ASEAN, for Latin America. Even so, there are some areas of inspiration as opposed to triggering novel insights with regard. Also, there's this general view that perhaps the, the crisis of uh, the EU makes the, the European Union less attractive as an object for comparison or as an object to emulate. And there's also this interesting <laughs> quote in, in an article by The Economist with the title No Brussels There, published in July 2060, where The Economist quotes the Chilean foreign minister, Geraldo Munoz, in this time saying that the lessons of Brexit is that integration must be flexible, concrete, and not bureaucratic. And the conclusions of the 
of the economists at this time was Latin American governments do not want to cede sovereignty to a supranational body, unlike Europe, neither history nor geography has encouraged them to do so. Mercosur as a small secretary, the Pacific Alliance is purely intergovernmental. It, if, it ha if it is to happen at all, Latin American integration will be very different from Europe. So we can, as a first conclusion, we can say that the EU has lost appeal and is no longer perceived as a model for regional integration based on the current crisis, which is inflected, I would say, on the one hand, in a certain downgrading of the construction of supranational regional institutions, the discussion about regional economic integration. This had been at the core of the debate when you, uh, when you have remember of, of authors of like Andres Malamud or Philip Schmitter who always criticized in Latin America there is no regional integration because there exists no supranational uh, institution. I think in general we have now in the, in the, in the debate a, a downgrading of this topic. And there's also nearly a new debate whether regional integration re really needs strong institutions in all regions. But also surprisingly, there have been quite different reactions in, in Latin America in regard to, to the crisis of the EU. On the one hand, I will come to this uh, soon, there is this position that now the argument, the dominant argument is that Latin America should be focused, Latin America regional integration should be focused on intergovernmental in, inter institutions instead of supranational institutions. There are also that they say there is no Brexit risk in Latin America because the institutions in Latin America are so weak. And there are also authors arguing that it's true that normally the institutions in Latin America are quite light, but there might also be the risk of what they call a suit amexit. So the first position is best reflected, I think, in the, in the annual report last year from the Inter-American Development Bank, where the, they clearly are, argue in, against supranational institutions. I think this quote, uh, you, you wouldn't have to, uh, found a, a similar quote some 10, 15 years ago by uh, international development banks, but the position in this annual report by the Inter-American Development Bank is, if anything can be learned from more than a half a century of integration is that complex architecture like customs unions with supranational institutions should be avoided. Instead, the objective should be a plain vanilla free trade zone with a focus on goods and services. Likewise, the institutional architecture should be intergovernmental rather than supranational in nature. Also here, clear positions by international development organizations for Latin America, they uh, they, uh, they, they say uh, they, they, Latin America should continue with this intergovernmental type of regionalism. And then there is this nice quote also from, from the Chilean political scientist Patricio Navia from the University of Diego Pactales, who argues that, that there's no risk of a Brexit in Latin America because there are no institutions such strong as in Europe, the European Union. So it, it's not worse for any country to leaving this institution, and, and he sees it as a failure of Latin American integration initiative. This was written in 2060 before the crisis of UNASUR. Perhaps today, P P uh, Patricio Navia would uh, argue in another way. But there have been also 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 uh, arguing uh, last year, like Nicolas Comini and Al Franklin in this in this in this quote. Uh, from the uh, from the Anuario de la Integración Regional de América Latina el Caribe, who who warned that there might be also in Latin America some kind of resoberanización de la política internacional. I don't know whether there is an English translation for this Spanish word, and I do not know whether this word also exists really in Spanish, but I, don't, I think it fits quite nice. And uh, and they uh, they argue um, they argue also that also when there are light institutions there might be also a certain risk that the members of this institution try to flexibilize the, 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 these institutions in regard to the to the norms and and to the and, 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 and to, to the rules. And, and in the end, what we will see uh, it seems that uh, Nicolas Comini and Alejandro Frankel had more reason than than Petro Navia, because what we see in Latin America in 2018, quite currently, that in April 2018. Six uh, member countries of the UNASUR decided to suspend their participation and also, what is more important, their payments to the budget of the organization. So in a certain way, uh, currently, uh, UNASUR is paralyzed and later on, also the president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreni, decided that the, the UNASUR building in uh, Ciudad de Mitad del Mundo should be converted in the university for indigenous studies and 
there's also now the discussion to take away the statue of, uh, of Nestor Kirchner, who is before the UNASUR building because of the corruption. I was there two weeks ago, I was still there, but it might be the last chance to see it. And, and, no, and now, uh, quite recently, one of the first foreign policy decisions of the new Colombian president, Duque, was that Col Colombia will definitely withdraw from UNASUR, and uh, Colombia hopes that other countries might follow. Us. So in a certain way, um, we have some common ground. Uh, while Europe is confronted with Brexit, South America has to confront Sutamexit. And there's this nice article by uh, Jose Antonio Sanoja, Nicolas Comini on this topic. And the question might be whether it's possible to compare the process of disintegration in Europe and Latin America. I will come back to this question later. Uh, I think I will say there are some authors like uh, Carlos Malamut in, in a recent commentary who say that, I've, I've, uh, that, that it's difficult to compare both because the, the, the structures of UNASUR and the European Union are so dif different and uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's n the UNASUR has nothing to do with, with trade, so it's quite, quite easy to, to exit from, from UNASUR and while other organizations like Mercosur still continue to function. Okay, bef before I, I go back to the question whether it makes sense to compare uh, Suta makes it and, and Brexit, I would like to make a little historical review uh, in regard to EU studies and the study of Latin American regionalism. And I would say this has been always a quite complicated relationship with ups and downs. And I think one can systemize, systematize a little bit the, this relationship in, in different periods. I think one, the first one I call the period of curiosity. And then the second one is the period of estrangement, then the, the period of admiration, the period of, of deception, then comes separation, and then later on a major, perhaps a, a major relationship. And now we are joined together, as I mentioned before, under the, under the headline of regionalism under stress. I think the, the first four periods I will be quite short because of, uh, because of times, uh, uh, time limitations. So I think the, the, I think the first period of, of uh, the relationship between EU studies and Latin American studies were the 1960s. There, in this time, Latin America was the only other reaching as a region outside of Europe, starting with regional integration projects uh, such as the Common Central Market, the Latin American um, Free Trade Association (LAFTA), and the Andean Pact in, in 1968. Uh, so it was not, it's not really surprising that this was also the first region where regional integration theories developed in relation to the European integration processes have been applied to another region. So Europe had been quite ha happy in the 60s. There's another region with some kind of integration process for, con for some kind of comparison. This was the time, I, I, I like very much this, this quote by Andres Malamut, uh, where he writes, uh, Philip Schmitter arrived, this is Philip Schmitter, the photo, arrived in Berkeley in 1961, the, where he was unexpectedly offered a job as Ernst Haas research assistant, according to a re reliable source. This had nothing to do with Schmitter's substantive qualification, but with the fact that Haas had learned somewhere that Schmitter spoke Spanish. Haas had a strange idea of trying to apply neo-functionalism to the recently formed Central American common market and the Latin American free trade area, which Schmitter did not even know existed. So this was the way how Philip Schmitter entered in this com more comparative regionalism study, going to Central America and later publishing about this subject. So in a certain way, in this, in this period, period uh, there was a new perspective for Europe for comparing experiences with regionalism. Uh, Europe was not longer the, the only case, the number one problem. So this was the first period. Then I would say this, the, the, the second uh, period started in the 1970s and also in the 1980s. There have been really very few studies on Latin American regionalism in this time. There was, no, there was not happening very much in regard to the regional organization. It, in this time, it was more a, a topic in Spanish for aficionados, for people really interested in this topic, but not one exciting uh, a broader audience. And there have been even less studies with a comparative perspective. Then this, this period ended, and I think would say that the 1990s, I think there was a new burst of regionalism in Latin America, as we all know. 
uh, with Mercosur, the, cr the, the, the transformation of the Andean pact to the Andean community, and, but also the transformation of the Central American integration system. And in 1990, I would say there was a certain admiration from the Latin American side. Latin America, Europe was seen as a, as a reference point, and many authors made reference to the experiences of the European integration process. Then came the next period, I would say, the, the 2000s. There was, uh, from the European side, a very critical view of the integration, integration experience in Latin America. One can, e can even speak of a La Latin America bashing. The criticism was there is no real regional integration. The regional is light. I think authors who represent this, this, this uh, string of, of uh, arguments are Andres Malamut. It's the photo of Andres Malamut with his skeptical view on Latin America, as you see. And and also Gianluca Gardini, which had a very critical view of what, what was happening in Latin America, and they, and they said this is not really regional integration. But one might also have a second lecture of, of, the, of the publications by Andres Malamut. What, in the end, he demonstrated in his studies, on one hand, he was very criti critical, critical in regard to, 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 to the integration process in Latin America, but what he also demonstrated that EU concepts and theories do not work in Latin, Latin America, there, that there are certain limitations for general relations of, in, of theories developed with a view in Europe. And in a certain way, for, 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 for specialists in European integration, there, this constituted new limits for the, for the comparison with other regions. So before, uh, before I continue with the prioritization, I will bring some more general reflections in this relation between EU studies and more comparative regionalism study with a view on Latin America. I think on, on one reflection, number one, is that the, 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 the influence of EU-based integration theory is, is related in a certain way to the power and influence of the EU in international politics. So as for what we see in the 1990s, the EU was one of the winners of the Cold War and in a certain way a role model for regional integration. There was the Maastricht Treaty with the creation of the European Union as European Union, the EU expansion in Eastern Europe, and in a certain way in Latin America, the EU was a competitor of the United States. Uh, the, at the end of the 1990s, they started these summits between the European Union and, 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 and Latin America. So this, this might, might explain why in the 1990s, also in the Latin American debate on, on regionalism and regional integration, the EU had a certain attractiveness. And then we, we see the change in the, in the, in the, in the current decade, in the 2010s. We have the US, the EU crisis, the, 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 the different EU crisis, the Euro crisis, the Brexit, the refugee crisis. We see the rise of anti-European populist parties in many European countries. And we see also the rise of China and Asia as a major Latin American partner and a competitor of the, of the European Union in, in Latin America. And this might explain also why the, the EU has lost attractiveness also as an example to emulate in academic debates. Reflection number two. Uh, there's a general problem that uh, when, we, when we look at EU studies and, and studies on Latin American regionalism, we, in a certain way, we have two separate um, epistemic uh, communities. There are very few researchers who really do both EU studies and Latin American regionalist studies. We have some specialists on Europe who have a more look sometimes on, on Latin America. But I think, uh, as, as far as I know, there are very few studies really comparing Europe and Latin America in, in certain sectors. Philip Schmidt did a little bit. I'm not sure whether he's more Europe, EU specialist or Latin American. Andres Malamut, I think he ne never published on the EU. He published a lot on, on Latin America, but with, but with a view based on EU-developed theories. Carlos Glosser is the same. And also Jose Antonio Sanauja mainly publishes on Latin America, but a little bit also on the European Union. So, and what we see is mostly looking from Europe to Latin America or studying Latin America with analytical tools developed in EU studies, but not the other way around. So you see here the Atlantic still dividing the researchers on both sides. Okay, reflections number three. I think there's a certain problem, I uh, see a general problem in applying the concepts and theories and analytical tools of regionalism from EU studies to Latin America. Why? I would say these instruments have been developed to find answers to the European puzzle. So the first puzzle was the why was there the creation of supranational institution in Europe? Why did this happen? So this then the, the second question is the survival and strengthening of supranational institution. There, I think all the neo-functionalist theories are quite important. 
And now more currently, we have a lot of series uh, se uh, reflecting about or theoretical approaches about disintegration and the exit from European institutions and, and the reasons behind these, uh, these, uh, these developments. But later, and I think this was this, this, I think this is the problem, the mistake, the series, series which had been de developed for the European puzzles were applied to other puzzles, to Latin American puzzles, and this created some problems of interpretation. But one, one might also ask, what, what are the Latin American puzzles? I think one puzzle might be uh, regionalism as an instrument of autonomy. There's a lot of literature on Latin American regionalism, studying whether regionalism might help Latin American countries to become more autonomous in international politics. There's the topic of overlapping regionalism and pluralistic regionalism, the question how this interaction of different regional organizations in Latin America function, what are the, 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 the effects. There might be also the puzzle, the Malamut puzzle, why does Latin America not comply with the objective of its own integration? There's a lot of study and there are a lot of regional organization with nice objectives, but when we look at the output, for example, in the Mercosur, uh, I think more, of, uh, more, more than half of the decisions by the Mercosur are not applied in national le legislation. And more recently, the question, I think, posted by uh, Pierre Rigirossi, I think when we accept that in Latin America we have a more intergovernmental type of integration with non-binding regional organization, what are the possibilities of this kind of uh, institutional arrangement? And that's of latest, the latest question, looking at the current crisis of, the, of regionalism in Latin America, what are the reasons for this crisis? Okay, but I think what uh, this might be puzzles, uh, uh, Latin American puzzle, I think what a puzzle not sh should be, uh, this was a puzzle for many years, why does Latin America not comply with the EU as a role model? Um, because this in the end resulted in a certain why, in a why not or deficit analysis, and I think the, 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 the value added was not very, very, very high in this regard. I would say a good example for, for what, what we should not do, not do uh, using uh, EU-based theory to Latin America is this article published by uh, Anders Malamut and Philip Schmidt in 2011 titled the, the Experience of the European Integration and the Potential for Integration in South America, where they start the article clearly de defining integration in European terms, the, the, that the, there's a tr transfer of sovereignty and that there are institutions cap capable of making decisions binding all members. And I think not surprisingly, when you start with this, uh, with, with this approach, uh, then the Indian community, the Mercosur, and the Latin American, other Latin, Amer the Latin American organization, which they are, which they are going to analyze, have made little progress towards integration. But it's not a surprising result when you start with this. But I think both authors go, 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 go a step f even further. They, they say they are totally against to flexibilize the, the, the definition of regional integration, so all what is not European integration is not integration. And they have also a bias that against all kind of regional cooperation, which does not resemble the, the European pattern. And I think in the end they say they dis that there might be a distinctive Latin American pattern of integration that which may, might be capable of resolving regional problems, asserting regional cohesion and building regional identity. Uh, and they, they doubt whether any other forms of regional cooperation which are not uh, similar to the European model might have any positive effect for the regions. And I think this, the same line in an article by Andres Malamud and Gianluca Gardini, 2012, they, they criticize that Lat regionalism in Latin America is a foreign policy resource used to achieve other ends, such as international visibility, regional stability, and regime legitimacy. But in the end, one might ask what is problematic with this self-declared goals. The only fault is that they do not correspond to a pre-established model. So I would say, I think this, uh, fortunately, I think this, this line of argument, this line of research has, has ended in a certain way because I would say that the focus on what Latin American regionalism is not was an obstacle to identify what constitutes Latin American regionalism, only to saying what, is, what it's not. It's not really value added to our knowledge. Okay, then I go back the next uh, in my periodization, the deception we had uh, with, with Malamut. Now we go to the separation of what we, uh, so a certain EU bashing on de oral centering. So in the in the 2010s, we, we, uh, 
uh, we see the dominance of a, of a much more critical view of transferring European concepts to Latin America, especially and in, on the side of Latin American scholars. One might even speak of a certain EU study splashing all what is related to the EU should not be transferred to Latin America. So we see the, the counter tendency. <laughs> And there's also a search, a look for new alternative concepts and analytical approaches. There seems to be now a broad consensus between scholars of Latin American regionalism, but also of other regionalism. I, I, I have this quote by scholars working in Asia on the beginning, not to take the EU as the gold standard for regional integration and cooperation, uh, because the focus on Europe and Europe-focused integration series led to a blind alley. In a certain way, with the crisis of the of the EU, the EU is no longer what uh, Philomena Moray called the integration snob, um, the, the, the example which uh, the others had to, to follow. So in this regard, the, the crisis had po possibly some positive effect. And Latin American scholars demonstrate a high creativity in regard to alternative concepts. Uh, I think it is, is not exhaustive, my list. They created the concept of post-liberal ritualism, post-hegemonic ritualism, anarchical ritualism, which I like very much, heterodox regionalism, post-trade regionalism, development regionalism. And I think this continues on the other side, cross-regionalism, rich, open reach reloaded. So I think uh, without the, this, this fixation on the European Union, we, 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 we see a, 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 a very uh, great creati creati creativity by Latin American scholars in creating concepts describing the regionalism in Latin America. To systemi systemize a little bit the different concepts, so these, these concepts uh, refer on, on one end on the objects of, of regional integration, so we have post-liberal, non-trade or positive, we, this, they, they refer to the institutional structure of regional organization, light, diplomatic, interpresidential, and they refer to the institutional configuration of regional organization, anarchical, heterodox, post-hegemonic, etc. Uh, I would say from all these concepts, uh, the, the concept of post-hegemonic regionalism was perhaps the most adequate concept to describe both new developments of Latin American regionalism since the first decade of the new millennium and to capture the changing mood of studies in Latin, Amer on Latin of Latin American regionalism. There's the, the, these two, two books published, the first one in 2012 by Pierre de Rossi and Dina Tassi on the rise of post-hegemonic regionalism, and last year the, the, the book by Bresenio Bres Bres uh, Mor and Morales on post-hegemonism in the Americas. Because in a certain way, I think this concept uh, captures the plurality of models of regional, regional cooperation, integration that exist in the different regional groupings in Latin America. And the concept of post-hegemonic regionalism implies in a certain way also liberation of thinking about concepts related to Latin American regionalism and also a certain emancipation from Eurocentrism of Latin American regional studies. I think there are generally there are two readings of this concept of post hegemonic regionalism. One is the reading that I gave you, that, is, that it's more flexible, more, more open. And the other one, the inter, inter, uh, they have to, there's this interpretation of post hegemonic with anti hegemonic regionalism, but I think my interpretation reflects more what is in these volumes I mentioned before. Perhaps what one might ask now, after this liberation from Euro European-based concept, what defines Latin American regionalism? So there is this nice quote by Oliver Abbey and Kevin Partinet, uh, Latin America is a continent with where many innovations in matters of regionalism emerge. So the question is what, what kind of innovations emerged? So I would say, the first time that Latin America is non-Europe, in none of the is not Europe in none of the Latin American regional organizations, we can observe a pooling of, of sovereignty or delegation of authority, which is important in the European Union. Neither do states exercise joint sovereignty rights, nor do they transfer authority and sovereignty. In a certain way, Latin American regionalism is intergovernmental and pluralistic, which results in weak or non-existing delegation of authority, the lack of supranational institution, a non-pooling of sovereignty, no more, there are no majority, majority decision in most regional organizations, as we saw now in UNASUR, because the UNASUR crisis was the result, there was no consensus about the new secretary, at the starting of the crisis, uh, no, no consensus about the new secretary general, but with a majority vote, uh, this crisis could have been avoided, but I'm not sure, there's also no regional law. But uh, Latin American regionalism includes overlapping regional organizations, frequent intergovernmental interactions, 
and also important, therefore it's more than only cooperation sectoral work, I think networks for policy, policy coordination, there's also something what we call regional norm diffusion, and there are also a certain kind of regional governance structures. So what I see now is a certain risk that the that I think it's it's right this de euro centering the domain uh, of of of, of, Latin, of the studies of Latin American regionalism, but there is now the risk that of a certain Latin American exceptionalism. This means the focus is only on the, of the analysis only on Latin America as a specific case, and. Uh, to to explain Latin American regionalism by the specifics of Latin American history and past dependency, going back to the independence and and Simon Bolivar. Uh, and the question is also really, is Latin American region really so different? I would say compare it to Europe, the answer is without doubt yes. But however, based on some of the attributes mentioned before, one might also argue that Latin American region has much in common with other non-European regionalisms. There's this quote by an article by Amitav Acharya in his handbook on comparative regionalism, where he defines uh, uh, the regionalism in the non-Western world, also with preservation of state sovereignty, prioritization of development, less formal or, le formal or leg leg legalistic institution, and a predominance of political will and cooperation. I think this is what describes Latin American regionalism, and also this description by Miles Kaler on, a on the Asian way of regionalism with the reluctance to delegate substantial authority to regional institution, limited delegation with low levels of legalization, intergovernmental and consensus building, Decision rules by consensus will also reflect what happens in Latin America. So perhaps compared to other regions, Latin American region is not so different as it is in the case compared to Europe. So I think what we need in the future is not a Latin America or, or a southern perspective on regionalism, but a global perspective. This would be my argument. Uh, this uh, perspective brings, on the one hand, regions in the center of the scene, calling for the importance of conceptualizing and investigating forms and functions of regionalism in an attempt to bring non-European experience into light. I think it's important that we include more the non-European experiences. But on the other hand, I think it's also important to include the European experience with regionalism to become really global. So I think we have to integrate different regional perspectives and experience for a global IR perspective on regionalism. So one of, uh, one of the approaches who tries this global perspective is this new perspective called uh, Comparative Regionalism with this book by Tanya Bertzel and Thomas Risse, published you know, in 2016, the Oxford Handbook of Comparative Regionalism. And with this handbook, we enter in the next period, in the period of major relationships between EU studies on regionalism and Latin American studies, which might be subsumed under the headline of Comparative Regionalism. So what, what can we understand on, with a major relationship of EU and Latin American regionalism studies? I think to bring back Europe, to bring Europe back to, into Latin American regionalism studies, we have to change our research perspective. We should not look from Europe to other world regions, but, uh, but also from other world regions to Europe, and perhaps analyze Europe from a Latin American perspective. I think this discussion that we have in Latin America on autonomy and sovereignty, is, is these are concepts which are also now more important in the current crisis of, of the EU. So it might be also possible to analyze European developments with a Latin, more Latin American perspective. And I, I think we should also expect to, uh, 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 except that European <laughs> regionalism and European integration are the special case. We should try to explain from the experience of other world regions why Europe is special in this regard, not explain why other regions are special from the European perspective. This might help us to better understand Europe, but also the regional realities in other world regions. And Latin, but on the other hand, Latin American regionalism studies should use more tools from the toolbox of EU studies, not, not only the, the big series, but also the, the instruments that are normally used in EU studies and adapt them to the regional context. And I think this is important when we take analytical instruments used in one region, we should also reflect whether we have to adapt these instruments to the different contexts. So I think the, the, there's also this caveat not to make the same mistakes. So the question is, can concepts and theories developed with a European perspective applied to Latin American regionalism? I would say yes or no. We have to look for the adequate concepts and the adapt these concepts to the regional context. I would say this discussion about regional integration, yes or no, by Marlon Wood and Spitter is not the right concept. Uh, 
the question is generally with a, whether retrieval integration is the adequate concept for comparison. So I think an alternative concept would be regional governance, which is now used in this, this handbook of, uh, of comparative regional listen by Bursel Risen. I also, I also strongly, uh, strongly advocated in some of my publications to use this concept of regional governance and uh, to, to, to differentiate between different types of regional governance, synergistic, cooperative, conflictive, or segmented governance, but it will be quite short. But there are also other concepts and research tools from EU studies that can, in my opinion, can travel but have to be adapted to the Latin American context. So is there's this concept that we know from EU studies of a variable geometry of institutional flexibility. Also this discussion about overlapping regional institutions, which also started in some regard in Europe. The concept of differentiated integration uh, that is used in EU studies, and, but, and also the, the, the topic of the diffusion between uh, the experience of different regional, ex uh, regional integration uh, 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 structures. So it will be quite short. I think the first one is this, this variable geometry and instrument flexibility. I found quite useful and quite influential this, this article by Stephanie Hoffmann and Frederic Moreau from 2012 on regional organizations a la carte the effects of institutional elastici elasticity. When I first, uh, first read this article, which was written with a view on Europe, I, I thought, okay, this, there are so many concepts that might, might be useful to think about to apply this concept to Latin America. And I think it's really uh, worthwhile. Uh, for example, they argue that it makes not sense to look only at one regional organization, for example, the Mercosur, but one has to look at the, at the whole uh, uh, institutional structure, how the different organizations interact. And they have a positive view that, that there might be a flexibility to, 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 to switch between different organizations uh, because when there is a blockade, there, there, there might there, there might be it might be easier to find a uh, common ground in another organization. So they, they really strongly argue in favor of institutional elasticity, <laughs> what, what we have also in Latin America. And there are also some politicians and academics in Latin America that use this concept. There's this quote by by Geraldo Munoz, who, who was at this time a Chilean foreign minister, who, 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 who takes the example of European variable geometry. No state of the region feels forced to belong in, to the entire club, and hence it's more willing to invest in the policy areas that are close to it. That's not from, 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 uh, from Munoz, but from Hoffman. But I think this, this is one concept which might travel to Latin America, this concept of institutional flexibility uh, will be the concept of overlapping regional listen, I will not go to this. Frita and I, we have published a lot on this, and I, something is boring to repeat what one has written recently, so I feel at once. Um, I found, then I, I, have, I found some very interesting articles as, as examples how, how you can use also concepts developed on Europe. And this is a very good article by Daniela Vanessa Perotta from, from Buenos Aires, who wrote last year this article on the, the diffusion of quality assurance policies in Mercosur. Where, he, where she analyzes the process of formation, decision-making, and implementation of the regional policy of higher education quality assurance, also the accreditation system in Mercosur, and its diffusion in domestic legal and political system. And she, she, she looks at how functions the Europeanis, Europeanization of policies in Europe. She, she used the concept of multi-level governments, policy networks, policy diffusion, and also this she takes from, from Asian regionalism of the regulari, uh, regulatory regionalism. This is an example of how you can take different tools from the toolbox of EU studies, not the whole theory, and to apply these tools in a contextualized way to la Latin American topics. And on the other hand, there is this book from 2013, another example by uh, Leuf and Rittberg and Schimmelfeng on differentiated integration explaining variation in the European Union, and there's a very interesting article in this uh, book by Brisenio Ruiz and Morales on post economic regionalism on Central America, where they use this concept of different integration to explain the process of, and the, 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 process of uh, the, 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 the experience of Central American uh, integration. This is, in my opinion, also an example where you can use concepts developed in Europe, adapt this concept to another context, and I think this uh, is an article really worthwhile to read because uh, in a certain way also the central American integration process are a little bit understudied when we speak of regional integration. We normally focus on South America or the whole Latin America. And on the other hand, this is now more recently coming a little bit to the disintegration. We might also use the concept of differentiated disintegration and there is this recent article 
in this book on the European Union crisis, where the author, Douglas Weber, speaks now about a different data disintegration where, uh, in the, in where this, this, when, you, when you take a, a look at the whole arch, a regional architecture where states exit or were excluded from, 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 from certain organizations, and when we look now on, at the current situation in Latin America with, with, Una, with UNASUR blockade, with the, with the expulsion of, of, of uh, Venezuela from Mercosur, it might be worthwhile also to use this concept to analyze some of the process uh, which currently uh, occur in, in, in Latin American regionalism. So I now come to the last point uh, of my presentation. Uh, this is the new uh, regionalism under stress. Coming back to the question, have the euro crisis and the Brexit been good or bad for comparative regionalism? I think it was perhaps good for the book by Bertzel and Rizzo that we see here, but as a promotion. Um, I, I think one, one might argue that the euro crisis and the Brexit have negative repercussions for the EU. They might improve the, the option for comparing European regionalism with regionalism in other regions. I think what we now see is a new focus in EU studies on the analysis of disintegration, which also brings new insights in regards to the processes of integration. What we see now in this study is that historical and regional context matters. I think there's a lot more, now more historically, historically contextualized studies on the EU. And I think this is a good thing. I also started to read again a little bit more about the history and of the EU. I think in the past we, we had too, more, too, too, much, too many abstract theories, so I think history matters more. Also, ideas and strategies matter. I think we, we have to look closer at the ideas and strategies of different actors in, in these processes. And what is also important is domestic politics matter perhaps more than before, than, than, than IR. I think very important here this article by Hooker and Marx on the past functionality of European integration, where they speak from this transfer from the permissive consensus where the, there was a certain room to maneuver for the politicians to a constraining dissensus now they are much more limited by the domestic audience. W what I think is not so helpful currently for this kind of comparison is the is, is neo-functionalist analysis. I think this is still too much EU-focused, and I think it's also quite difficult to apply neo-functionalist analysis of the EU crisis to other regions where there exists no sovereign national institution. I think for neo-functionalism, you know, this bureaucracy, the spillover, spillback. So I think this article perhaps by Schmitter, Lefouri, is uh, might not so be useful for comparison. But I think there's, there's also, there should be also a caveat. It's, it may be difficult to compare European and Latin American crisis of regionalism. On the one hand, I think there is, uh, what, what makes the difference, there is this lack of a supranational institution and a supranational bureaucracy in Latin America, which may give continuity to regional projects in times of political conflicts between governments and which may make exits more costly, as we see in Europe, it's more costly when you have this bureaucracy, this supranational institution. We see now the negotiation about the Brexit, very complicated. I think to, to leave the UNASUR is not, has no cost, it's cost-free. No? No. And, uh, and on, on the other hand, also moreover, the transnational links and the e economic interdependence in Latin America is much weaker. We know interregional trade is less than 20%, so it's much easier also to exit. And I think both factors lower the exit cost from regional organization in Latin America. And in the end, as I mentioned before, exits have much less repercussions, whether you are a member of UNASUR or not, I think for the broader public, the, the, the impact in the daily life is not there. It's a difference when you exit the European Union. I think there are, nevertheless, I would say there are some approaches and concepts to explain the EU uh, crisis might also be adapted to the crisis of Latin American regionalism. I think on the one hand, one might differentiate between unidimensional uni or multidimensional crises as the current crisis of the EU, where we have all the, the refugee, the Brexit, the, the, the still not ending euro crisis uh, with some of the countries and, and also the, the problem of the domestic uh, and the domestic uh, uh, of domestic actors with right wing populism and one might also differentiate between endogenous and external shocks leading to crisis and external internal crisis I think in the case of Latin America UNASUR is it's only it's an internal crisis there has to be no external shock this might be useful Moreover, one might also identify different types of disintegration, horizontal disintegration, vertical disintegration, and subtural disintegration. So horizontal disintegration refers to the number of countries of participating in the regional project. I think this, have, this we have in Latin America, so countries are leaving certain organizations. 
It's more difficult to adapt vertical disintegration to Latin, America, to Latin American context because this dimension refers to the reduction of competence and the power of supranational organ organs which do not exist in Latin America. But I think also one might also adapt this concept to the Latin America due to the under, uh, uh, it might be redesigned as diminishing under governmental interaction, a weakening of administrative structures and linkages between countries. And the last point is sectoral disintegration, which refers to the number of issue and policy errors covered by regional projects. And I would see also in a moment in Latin America and South America, we see a kind of sectoral disintegration, cooperation in, in the defense and security is stagnating, health and so on, while we, we, we see a new focus on, on economic cooperation now with the negotiations between the Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance. How could, can we define a crisis of integration? Can the definitions develop in regard to the EU crisis travel to Latin America? I, I found this article by, by Frank Schimmelfending. He defines a crisis in European integration as a decision-making situation with a manifest threat and a perceived significant probability of disintegration. I think we can all adapt this also to Latin American context. And he defines disintegration as a reduction in the existing levels, COVID membership of integration, I think also with some we can also adapt this to analyze the processes currently in Latin America. Uh, so I think uh, while developed for a European type of integration, it might also be used to analyze a crisis of intergovernmental regions in Latin America. Then I, I found some other interesting uh, recent publications which may, might be adapted to, to the to Latin American uh, crisis of regionalism. There is this interesting study by Balmer and Jonathan Joseph uh, on European integration in crisis who will develop an, a critical integration theory. And I think what is important in this, in this article is that they demonstrate that European integration was never a, a single Korean and new unified project, but the outcome of competing hegemonic projects, what we see all when we explain, try to explain why UNASU is disintegrating, I think at the beginning there were, had been competing hegemonic project, there was a certain consensus for a moment, and now this consensus is not anywhere more. And I think also integration is about power contestation uh, around economic and political ideas. I think this can be also used. And I think that uh, he, they've put a very strong fo focus on the, also on the domestic level, which might hinder integration. So I think critical integration theory might open a new perspective for comparing Latin American and European integration process. So from a comparative perspective, I might also ask why Europe had opted for a model to integrate different and competing hegemonic regional projects in one regional organization, the EU, while Latin American regional projects have materialized, creating different and sometimes competing regional organization. Moreover, one should st study more po domestic politics, the actors' interests and coalitions in Latin American uh, countries, and and uh, regional projects and strategies from the perspective of political leaders. I think this should also come more in the focus of future studies. I will be now quite short. There is this interesting article also by Christina Schneider on the political economy of regional integration, where she t takes a very puts a very strong focus that is important to take the, 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 the strategy goals of political leaders serious. So what uh, at first from the outside might s seem like a shallow regional organization uh, uh, might be might be I quite, might be in the interest of 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 of, of the of, of the of the politicians or the, the government which dis had designed this kind of uh, uh, management. Then another one, I think uh, another article who puts a strong focus on on that regional integration is very strongly related to to crisis of regional leadership. So in a certain way, he would argue that the, the EU is still surviving because there is still some German leadership now with France, and what we have now in in Latin America is a lack of leadership. Perhaps we do not need a single leader. Collective leadership or cooperatively might might do it also. And another one who is uh, another article by Hans Vollert, who puts its focus on does disintegration uh, processes start with a, with a weakening in boundary control and system building and a lack of, co uh, of behavioral conformity and declining behavioral conformity within a community of states, what we see now also in the current Venezuela crisis, where the, the lack of consensus, what, is, what are the basic norms of a democracy, is, 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 a, is a little bit uh, behind this crisis. And there are now might be partial exits in Europe now with, with, uh, as, as, as in Latin America. So I come to the end. So the question that we have now, this are the open questions. My article is also still a little bit work in progress. What, is, what are the future 
challenges. I think we have shared problems, uh, but are there also shared uh, research perspectives. I think one challenge is on the Latin, on the European side, we should have show more, less Eurocentrism. We should be more open for the experience in other regions, look for broader contexts. In Latin, the Latin American side, I, I would say we need less Latin American parochialism to look only Latin America from their own historical trajectory. Di and what we need is also more really comparative studies. I think there are not many studies comparing the experience in, in different regions. What are the possible topics for comparative studies? I think disintegration might be one of the topics. There is this uh, nice article which I read yesterday in the evening uh, by Dermot Hodson and Uwe Pritter who asked the question, what would European EU scholars study if the, if the EU were to fall? So then they developed different alternatives. So we might also ask what would Latin American regional scholars like us study if UNASUR were to fall? If the, we would lose an, an object of study, what would we shoot? So I think, I think with this open question I will end and I thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for your question in Portugal, English, German, whatever you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>
question, I will answer now because some question, otherwise I, I would sum it up. I, I think I, I didn't mention the, the, the OIS because what was important for me to, to look uh, in this relation to between the EU studies and, 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 and studies of Latin American regionalism and normally in, 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 this, in this line of investigation, the, the OIS is not, not part because it's, it's an, an all-American organization. I, 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 did al I did also some work on the OIS, but I think for this, for this, for this uh, specific topic of how EU studies influence studies of Latin American regionalism, the OIS perhaps is not, 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 so, not so important. You're right, uh, I, I should also mention more the, the Caribbean, Latin American Caribbean, but on the other hand, what, what I mentioned when I made the reference to this article by, by Olivier Darben, e, uh, Kevin, Kevin Parthenay, that, that, that is also a certain bias in, 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 the, in the studies of Latin American regionalism by Latin, Amer Latin American researchers. They mostly look at, at uh, the organization in South America, the Mercosur, UNASUR, uh, of late also on CELAC, and S Central America is not really, t t uh, really, r really taken into account for comparative studies. I, I agree with, with, with I think. Therefore, I found this article uh, by, by, the, by these French authors quite interesting because in a certain way they, they, they show that it is important to study also what ha is happening in Central America, and I would agree also one should also agree the Caribbean organizations. I also agree with you that perhaps it's uh, whether whether UNASO is totally dead, but it might be dying, so we will see a regional organization. It's, it's quite difficult that, that, they, that they disappear, and there are not many disappeared really, but I also for the, for, the, for, the, for the next time, I do not see really much perspective of a reanimation of UNASO, because I think as far as I see, in, in most of the, of the countries, there's no real interest. I think Brazil has no interest, Argentina has no interest, Chile has no interest, Colombia is leaving. <laughs> and Paraguay has no interest, Peru has no interest, so I see it quite difficult uh, that there will be a giant change of mind, perhaps in, in, in some future, in the case that UNASUR should, should survive as some shallow organization, there might be in another constellation some interest to re reanimate it, but for the moment I agree totally. And, uh, and on the other hand, UNASUR had never this economic component, so for I think the business people, UNASUR was never an, never an entity because this was the one area trade and economics which was not inside of UNASUR. What, what I didn't, I think this, I, I did not uh, t take the EU as an international actor and its influence on Latin America. I, I agree, I agree fully that this, this is an important topic. I let, I think it's not, perhaps not so important in this discussion of, of EU studies, Latin American studies, but when we, when, but it, but this would be another presentation and I had some problem to, to keep my time, but I, I think it's an important point. It's an important actor, but not so much in influencing the type of integration in Latin America. This has been in, in the 90s, but as a foreign policy actor, you, you mentioned the negotiations between Mercosur and, and the EU. I'm not sure whether they will ever happen. I think France is the country which is, block, which is blocking it in, in, in Europe, so I'm a little bit skeptical on this. Okay, that's just for the moment.
We start with, with, with the last question. Uh, yes, I, 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 I skipped the Caipirinha yesterday in the evening with, with Britta to, to, to bring in the new literature, so this will have to bring some sacrifices. <laughs> uh, uh, no. What about the, 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 uh, the, the quality of, of, of study? I think uh, for me, I think that we, we have this, uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, this contradictory development, I think. Latin American mutualism is, is in crisis, but we have a certain boom of uh, Latin American publications from re Latin American researchers on, on mutualism and mutual development. It might be that uh, the crisis is, is good for publications, like bad news is good news for, uh, for newspapers. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. But I think in general, uh, I, I, it might be that this might be, uh, it was not, not planned to, not to mention here, uh, Brazilian also, but I normally when I read on mutualism, I, I read literature from all Latin American countries, and I think, I would say in a moment, that when we look at the visibility, I think Argentina has a certain advantage. I think they, they have this cluster in, in Flaxo, Argentina, and they started earlier with Dina Tassi, and, and but I think also in, in, in Brazil, I think when, when in other publications, I also quoted the Brazilian authors, and I, when, I, when I am screening the literature, I'm look, looking also at Brazilian uh, journals of Brazilian relations or contextual international and I think in, and I think and I think also in general the, the, the standard has, has improved very much in, in the last years I think with, uh, 
And I think I, I mentioned now more European uh, authors because I was looking a little bit in, in the last part of the paper how this new studies on European disintegration might be used for Latin America. This is explains why there's a certain, a certain bias. Uh, the costs of exiting from UNASUR, as, as far as I know, also the, the South American Defense Council has not, uh, is, is paralyzed, uh, not, not only today, it started some years ago. At the beginning, there were, well, have been a lot of plans, a lot of activities, but as far as I, s I see, this had slowed down in, 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 in the past years. And I think for conflict mediation, you don't need uh, the Defense Council. I think there was more to create transparency in regard to defense uh, expenditure and this kind of stuff. And I think in, in the end, in, at, at the core of the current crisis is, uh, is, is uh, of UNASUR is the failure to mediate in the, in the Venezuelan crisis. I think this is, this is the, uh, at the core. And, and, and therefore, I think it was not possible in the mediating this crisis. So I think what, what to do with these institutions. And uh, quite surprisingly, when we see now, uh, some years ago, I, there was still the expectation that in a certain way, UNASUR what would substitute the organization of American states in South America and that UNASUR would become the, the actor, South American pro problems become solved by Brazilian, South American actors. I think the surviving institution where, where they still discuss the, the, the topic of Venezuela is the organization of American states. So in the end, we see a, re a reinforcement of the organization of American states because of the failure of, of, of UNASUR. The question, uh, why Latin America has not more advanced in, in the creation? Yesterday I had, uh, had a presented a paper, it was in Spanish, in, 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 in English it would be the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, past and present of Latin American integration, where they had a list on, on, on the, the positive factors, the negative factors, and the more current crisis factors. I think the, one of the great challenges is, on the one hand, that, that that economic, economic integration is, is very low in Latin America when you take the basic, the basic indicator for economic integration, inter-region and trade. I think on a wor worldwide scale, uh, uh, in the last 15, 20 years, around 45% of trade was inter-region trade. And when we look at Latin America, it's less than 20%, which is inter-region trade. So we have this lack of an economic basis for closer economic integration. And on the other hand, I think uh, also I think at, at, at first sight it's 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 a, had a, it's a homogeneous region, but I think there are a lot of difference, and you have different subsystems. You have the Central American subsystem, the Caribbean subsystem, and also uh, in a certain way we have all those. You can also speak of subsystems in South America, the Andean countries, uh, Brazil with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, countries. So I think this might explain. I think it's only on, on first view that. that on, on the other hand, because of, of the history of. Uh, independence and of, uh, of influence by outside powers like here in the United States, this, this element of sovereignty and the, the preservation of autonomies is quite important and I think this makes it difficult to have a more closer closer cooperation. I would put in, in a short version, but if you send the, the longer version, it's in Spanish, I would put only the, the audio in it. Uh, presidential, democracy, uh, presidential democracy, I think it, it, it's right, I think uh, the, the, we, 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 there, there are this excellent articles by Andres Malamud on, on presidential uh, democracy and the, the impact on, on, on foreign policy. On the one hand, I, I would say in, in good times, it facilitates a lot of things when the presidents have the same ideological orientation, integration projects, cooperation projects might advance. But on the other hand, this is the, the, the dark side of uh, presidential democracy when there is disagreement, ideological conflicts, nothing is moving, what we see now in, 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 in Asur. I'm not sure whether whether it's basically uh, the, the political system, presidential democracy, which explains why uh, integration has not more advanced here in Latin America than in Europe. I think what we see now also with parliamentary democracies in Europe, with 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 the with the growth of right-wing populist parties, we see also blockades in in Europe. I think it's more domestic politics. I would say domestic politics might become more and more important to to explain advances in. In the integration uh, cooperation processes. Yes.
say it to someone. General in, in the past, the European Union uh, was was always in, in, in favor of integration of of of, 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 uh, of, of, Latin, of Latin America. I think they used to finance for many years the institution in, in the Central American market. I think also the the Parliament of the Andean Community was financed by the European Union. Uh, there was European money uh, going to Latin America to, to reinforce the, the institutions. Whether the the trade policy of of, of Europe had a, a negative effect on Latin America. I'm not sure. I would see uh, would, would see uh, a much a much uh, much greater impact by by the trade policies of China. What we have seen in the last 15 years, of course, because of the, due to the to the growth of the importance of China as a trade partner, Latin America, we we, we see a reprimarization of, of 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 the trade structure of Latin America. In the case of Brazil, I think today the. the Brazil exports much less manufactured products than, than some 15 years ago. And I think this reprimarization explains also why intra-regional trade is so low, because when you export commodities, I think you, you would not trade oil between Colombia and Venezuela, because all, both are uh, producing oil and uh, or bananas with uh, or coffee between uh, Brazil and, and, and Ecuador. And I think this, this reprimarization is, uh, might be a factor which makes it more difficult to an economic integration. And the United States in, in general was not very much in favor of integration in, in Latin America. They, 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 they had this big project of the free trade area of the Americas, which ended in 2005. They had this idea to bring Latin America t together. But it was also in part at the beginning a Latin American idea. I would say that there's certainly a negative effect, and I, and, and I would also see t today that, that the policies of, of Trump uh, surely, surely uh, are without doubt not, not advancing integration. At the beginning, there was this idea because of the Trump pressure of Trump, Latin American countries would cooperate more, there would be more cohesion. What we see that each country is trying to find this special arrangement with the United States, hoping not to to get on the radar screen of tr Trump or on the Twitter account of, 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 of Crown and to find some special relationship like Colombia or Argentina. So this, I would, currently it's also negative. Both China and United States are currently a more negative factor for integration process. I would see, perhaps this is my European bias, I would see the European role, Europe, Europe role more positive. I think the Pacific Alliance is, is one of, of, of the models. I think the, the, what, what makes the Pacific Alliance uh, different, it's, 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 a, it's a small group of, of four countries which, which share for many years a similar uh, development strategy. We will see what, what happens now in Mexico, but, but as far as, I, as I, what I, what I've read, I think Lopez Obrador has, not, has no intention to, to leave the, the, the Pacific Alliance. But we, when we look at, 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 at I think it's another, it's, it's, another, it's another model. It's not about uh, creating. Uh, on one, it's it's, it's trade driven, but not in the in the sense as it as it was during the time of the, of the so-called open regionalism in the 1990s to, to create a big common market and to increase trade within this region. Because as we know, inter-regional trade within the Pacific Alliance is three per three percent. It's the lowest of all regional integration. It's more a joint trade promotion with other regions, with, with Asia sp uh, specific. It could be a model in regard to a, uh, to a broader trade liberalization, as you might know. Currently, uh, nearly 90% of trade within Latin America is free of tariffs because, because of the different uh, integration schemes that we have and the agreements. But where we still have a lot of obstacles is in, re in regard to non-tariff uh, non non barriers like, uh, like technical standards, health standards. 
or, but also in regard to the accumulation of, of, of uh, regimes of origin, whether whether a product is defined as a national product or not. And I think they are, they are the, uh, the Pacific Alliance is advancing a lot, so it might in this case it be an example for, for, the, for the rest of Latin America. And there's also a certain expectation, or it, it, it's, it's a project promoted very much currently by international uh, development organization or banks like the World Bank or the International the Inter-American Development, but also I think by CEPAL to create something like a, a Latin American free trade zone. And I think as, as you might know, some weeks ago, the Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance signed an agreement to advance in this direction. So in, in I think in this, in this regard, the, the, the Pacific Alliance might be pushing the rest of Latin America in, in, in a certain direction. And but uh, it's, it's also quite, sp quite specific because it has very much this, this trade promotion strategy. I think it's an organization with f four member countries, but with 55 observer states, which is also a very strange institution. And it has been quite successful in, in promoting an image. We are the good guys in Latin America, the good economies promoting trade. And I think this was a very important element. And the beginning also, I think, of some strategic geopolitical element of balancing against Brazil, and bringing Mexico back, back to, to South America. But I think currently, I think there's not much Brazilian foreign policy, so there's also not need of balancing against Brazil, but this might change in the future. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so then if that's not the case, I would like to thank from, from the side of the Chair for German and European Studies, Institute of International Relations, and the Department of Political Science, who all participated in the organization of this event. And of course, Liga, um, uh, who kind of uh, financed it. That's right, because we're also going to a different conference in Brasilia tomorrow. Um, so many kind of partners collaborated in making possible this day here. And I would like to thank everybody involved. And I remembered what I wanted to say originally in the beginning. Uh, already making promotion for the next upcoming events. Um, among them, uh, Jornadas Europeas, especially for those of you interested in European issues, the current crisis in Europe and of the European Union. Uh, so this will be a series of events this semester with six uh, morning sessions uh, happening in the law faculty, but involving scholars not only from law, but also from political science, international relations, economics, uh, etc. Um, and focusing on different topics such as the development of democracy, security, migration, separatism, economic development, etc. Um, yeah, with, with talks, guest lectures, roundtables, uh, workshops uh, on these different issues. Uh, the preliminary program is already online on the BAAD Brazil website, and like towards the end of the week, we'll also start a bit more massive. Uh, promotion of the event uh, so that you will know hopefully uh, more about it. And you're very welcome to participate. Mm -hmm. And Jamila was, I think, going to make a little yeah, announcement. Yeah, yeah.
sein, das kann eh niemand lesen von mir. Noch nicht so überlegt. Aber ich glaube, ich glaube die Abkommen mit Lateinamerika sind ja relativ umfassend. Ich meine, das Problem bei den Mercosur-Abkommen ist einfach, dass die, die, die Brasilianer und Argentinier gerne den europäischen Agrarmarkt haben wollen. Und dann kommt das Problem, dass die Argentinier und Brasilianer nicht wollen, dass Brasilien ihre Agrarmarkt hat. Und ich glaube, das ist ein Problem, das wir nicht lösen können. Und ich glaube, das ist ein Problem, das wir nicht lösen können. Und ich glaube, das ist ein Problem, das wir nicht lösen können. Und ich glaube, das ist ein Problem, das wir nicht lösen Nicht nach, was auch nicht nachvollziehbar ist. Ich meine, wir haben immer so einen Beitrag zum Sozialprodukt und Arbeitsplätze ist ja wir haben ja eine gute Lobby. Ne? Und ich glaube, der, der europäische Konsument ist so lange gerade nicht Vegetarier, ist, wurde wieder medizinisches Gast oder dauerhaft? Nee, ich bin nur auf Ihr Ah ja, das ist schön. Ciao. 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 And uh, Brazil has now uh, ra ratified uh, uh, but Brazil has ratified this new uh, because now it's no the only international organization. Oh yes, oh that's fine. I give you my okay, thank you. Oh yes. You know this organization of Brazil, Latin America is quite complicated because we smoke for ten foot a long time. That's right. Yeah. I think so. 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 I think